name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So, it's great to see you all. It's great to see uh, some uh, all the familiar faces and new faces. Welcome to all of you as we, we're, we're wrapping up this series. But uh, don't worry if you haven't been here for the last five weeks. We'll start off with a summary. Um, and so, uh, the series has been called Gianting. And, and you'll understand very quickly why. We've been talking about growth. And maturity um, in all kinds of different spaces and, and uh, different phases of life and and uh, we talked about how growth comes in cycles and some things kind of you know they grow and then they mature and then they, they die and then they grow again like like cyclically like like plants um, and but some things kind of don't grow cyclically like they kind of just keep growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and I was Telling you all at my grandma's place uh, on her wall in the kitchen, she would measure us up. There's like 16 of us cousins or something. I don't know, I think we're 12, 12 or 13 cousins or something. And uh, she would measure us up on the wall, and, and, and no one ever kind of got smaller. Like we all seemed to kind of get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as soon as like you know the airplane would land, you know I just want to run right out of the airport straight to my mother's my grandmother's kitchen to see if any of my cousins outgrew me. You know what I mean? And uh, a race to see who will be uh, the tallest. And it's more sort of linear growth. And St. Anthony, the great, uh, this guy who lived in the third and fourth century, uh, uh, coined to be the father of, of monasticism um, and a spiritual giant. Uh, he he uh, went and walked into church one day and he heard, he heard uh, somebody reading uh, Jesus teaching uh, and, and Jesus was teaching and saying, if you wish to be perfect, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And he had, uh, his parents had recently died and he inherited a massive fortune, about 350 acres, um, with slaves and servants and buildings and houses and barns. And he, so he sold everything and he made sure his sister was well cared for and he went out uh, to be um, alone with God. And he went and learned from various different elders at the time how to live with God. Um, and um, and then uh, as he, you know, no one really had much left to teach him, he journeyed out into the eastern desert uh, near the Red Sea. Um, and, uh, and then as he grew older, uh, his fame spread throughout all the known world. And people would come to him from all over the world, kings, philosophers, uh, you know, church people, secular people would come and seek his wisdom and his guidance. And so we figured, you know what, for six weeks, why don't we seek his wisdom and his guidance and look at the ancient writings from his time, things he said about how to grow and how to mature in, in spiritual life. And he says, the first thing he says is that you, all you need to grow with Christ in spiritual life. He's not talking about theology. He's not talking, he's just talking about to grow in your life with God is to follow the commandments of Jesus. He says the commandments of Jesus are your roadmap. And the good news is that sometimes you read a book and you wish you could talk to the author, but the author of those commandments is the Holy Spirit that inspired men of old and worked with them, used the words that they would use um, and didn't, didn't whisper in their ears and tell them what to write. He inspired them and they wrote with the words that they knew how to say. And that same spirit indwells every single believer. So what you read, you know, is, is inspired by the spirit. And what's inside of you, guiding you and directing you is the same spirit. And there's like this synergy happening between what you read and between... Uh, what's happening inside of you at St. Anthony is telling that was his second lesson to us. And the third thing he told us was that the most dangerous thing that we can do is to regress backwards, to accept regression. Spiritual life is supposed to be one of those things of continual growth, not kind of cyclical growth. And we spent a lot of time talking about that and we talked that the mindset of maturity uh, is is what ensures consistent spiritual growth. The first thing is to press onwards, to always uh, have it set in my mind that I'm always going to keep moving forward, one foot instead in front of the next. I'm going to forget the past, 
I make a new start every day, no matter how successful I am. St. Anthony would say, I'm beginning my monastic life every morning. Every, I mean, he was a monk, he'd been a monk for 90 years. And he'd say, or 80 years, he'd say, I'm beginning my monastic life today. Today is my first day. Never consider that he was so advanced or so whatever. And the same thing if we fall, if we sin, if we, if we feel like we're moving backwards. I make, it, make a new start every day. Forget the past and keep my eyes on the prize. And St. Anthony was telling us that, you know, there's some things in life where you have to kind of diversify your portfolio and have multiple interests, keep multiple fingers in multiple pots. Well, spiritual life is not one of them. He was telling us you got to put all your eggs in one basket. He was telling us if you're of two minds, you're going to be of two hearts. And if half your mind and half your heart is over there and half your mind and half your heart is over here, one thing is for sure that your, the half your, the, your mind and your heart, which is over there, is going to be missing out on what's going on over here. God wants all of you. He wants all of your attention. He wants all of your focus. And he is willing to bless it and to make something amazing out of it. The next thing he told us is kind of counterintuitive. Um, he told us to remember our faults, not to remember them in all of their detail, not to be, feel shame or blame or guilt about them, not at all, none whatsoever, no. But to remember that once upon a time there was a guy named John and he did such and such. And that keeps us humble and it keeps us walking the straight and narrow. And if I know that I'm like, you know, I'm not super into sweets, I really like salty stuff. Put a bag of chips anywhere within arm's reach and it will be an endangered species, right? That's me. My wife loves sweets. I need to know that about myself. My wife can buy as many danishes as she wants and bring them to the house. I'm probably not going to touch them. Every time I look at them, I'm probably going to say, I'd rather have a second helping of dinner, right? That's what goes on in my mind, right? And I know that, but I know that a bag of chips cannot enter our house with me not eating. It's just not going to happen. I got to know myself, and I know myself by remembering by remembering my old faults. I don't feel bad about them. I'm, a, I'm not ashamed. I'm telling you about my, my, my potato chip addiction with no shame or guilt at all, right? I just know myself and I know I need to stay more than arm's length away from every bag of chips out there, every bowl of chips at every party. I gotta, you know, what distance is safe? More than arm's length, you know what I mean? I know how many drinks I can have if I go, if I go somewhere. I, I need to know myself, right? And I know myself in part by my faults. And ignoring those completely, pretending like those things have never happened, would be foolish, St. Anthony tells us. Last week he was telling us that joy, spiritual joy, joy from, the, from God, joy that in your heart, that is the fuel for the journey. All of these teachings and all of these principles and all this stuff is good. But if your car doesn't have fuel, you ain't going nowhere, right? Joy is what gives you the incentive to move on. In fact, he told us a number of things. He told us that joy is the power for spiritual life, is the sign of a sound spiritual life, nurtures our soul, elevates our mind, is incentive for persevering in the struggle, conquers Satan's traps, blesses the present, Confirms a triumphant future, assures strength and success of repentance. Don't go on this journey without joy. If you're not enjoying your life with God, talk to somebody who knows something about it. Because it's supposed to be full of joy. And joy is the fuel that's going to get you to the finish line. Joy is what gives you confidence that there even is a finish line. Joy is what lets you know what the finish line is looks like and that's what we're going to talk about today as we're going in this journey from growing to be from this little cute little kitten to the lion that god wants to make each one of us as we mature in this in this process that's what we're talking about today we're talking about the finish line we're talking about what does it look like what does it look like to run across the banner of the finish line and tear that ribbon what does it look like to be standing at the podium and, and win that gold medal. What does it look like? What does it feel like? If you can sink your teeth into it, if you can feel that this is, this is a certain reality, not some kind of vague 
story that somebody made up somewhere along the line. Somebody had too much to drink and they made up this thing called heaven. You know, like if you can, if you can be certain uh, and you can almost taste it in your mouth, it makes it that much easier um, to walk the journey with confidence and joy. So St. Anthony, what do you have to tell us about perfection? Lastly, his last two teachings to us are that perfection in spiritual life is achieved through diligence. But Christian perfection is something else. That's achieved through grace. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how they're different. And one does not suffice for the other. We need both. So there's spiritual, there's perfection in spiritual life. And then there's Christian perfection. They're different. They're highly related, but they're different. One is achieved through diligence. We talked about that last week. That the joy of the spiritual walk is what gives us desire and energy to work hard. But the perfection in Christ comes through grace. And the teachings of the Holy Fathers that have come before us for years and years and years, they illuminate our path. They show us the path of how to get there. Now, what comes to your mind when you hear the word perfect? I'm sure different things come to different people's minds. I like to cook, so it's sort of like if I've just seasoned something and I taste it and I turn around from the, from the stovetop and turn to my wife and go like this, you know? That's, that's, that's perfect, you know? Well, that's because I like to cook. I don't know if you're a... If you're a runner, you know, it might be, you know, winning a marathon. If you're a dancer, it might be, you know, getting all tens. You know, the, you know, if you're, if you, I don't know, whatever it is. What is it for you? What is, what is perfect for you? If you're a student and we're in exam season now, all you're thinking of is perfect can only mean one thing. It's 100% on an exam or an A+, plus, right? What is a, what is perfect? Whatever perfect is to you, I can tell you something it is, I can't read your mind, but I can tell you something it is also for me. Perfect is all of those things that I just mentioned, but perfect is also something that seems just out of reach. Perfect is something that sometimes I've convinced myself is some figment of my imagination. Perfect is an ideal that we work towards but we'll never get to. Perfect is a holy grail that you spend your whole life searching for and you never know if you're going to find it. People have talked about it. It's like the Loch Ness Monster or something, you know? People have talked about it. No one has actually seen it, right? Or is it? I don't know. Now, there's a problem with thinking this way. And, and I'm guilty of it too, right? That at first glance, I allow myself to think that perfect is all of these beautiful things, but perfect is not for me. And the problem with that is when we stop believing in the impossible, it becomes impossible to us. When I stop believing that I can, you know, I can run a marathon in under four hours, it becomes impossible to me. But other people have done it. Other people have figured it out. And with help, training, coaching, some benevolence from some other people, etc., maybe it's not maybe it's not out of reach for me. But the moment that I and you accept that something is impossible, one thing is for sure, it just became impossible for you and for me. Now, it may have always been impossible, right? It may have always been impossible. One thing is certain, now it is. I mean, what would the world look like if the Wright brothers would have said it's impossible to fly? Forget about if they would have said it, if they would have listened to the people who told them, the folks who, you know, had the first sustained flight. Other people had managed to get airborne. You know, like, look at this, watch this, I'm going to invent flight. Right? I was airborne. No, they, the, the Wright brothers were the first ones to have the first sustained flight, you know, to take off and stay off the ground for a period of time. They start off with bicycles and 
flapping wings and all kinds of things until they finally constructed a model that it could not accept it was impossible. Michael Jackson, not that he's you know, the, the, the authority in all things theological, but nonetheless says, often people just don't see what I see. They have too much doubt. You, you can't do your best when you're doubting yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, who will? But did you get that? You can't do your best if you doubt it yourself. Oftentimes people come up to me and tell me, Father John, I did my best and it just didn't work out. You know, I never stopped to, to ask somebody, did you believe in yourself before you did your best or not? Food for thought. One of my favorite quotes about mentorship um, and about, about coaching is from Johann Wolf, Wolfgang Goethe, who's a, a poet and a philosopher, German poet and philosopher. He says, treat a man as he appears and you make him worse. Treat a man as if he were what he potentially could be and you make him what he should be. you got to believe in people if you want to bring them to where they could be even if everything they've done up until now gives you every reason in the world not to believe in them. They will stay where they are or, or decline. If you believe in them and invest in them, they will grow to everything that they could be. But this is true. This is true of us. It's true of us. It's not, it's not only true of how we treat others. It's true, it's true of us. St. Augustine says something really beautiful. He says, faith is to believe in what you do not see. And the reward of this faith is that you see what you believe. So you believe in something which you cannot see, and you pursue it. The natural result is that you find it. You find it. You take hold of it. Today, God wants to breathe new life into you and into me and into perfection in your mind and in, 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 in mine. That it is possible for you and it is possible for me to believe in it and to one day, before long now, sink our teeth into it and it will be, it will be ours. How, St. Anthony? How, how am I going to get to from where I am now, which is far from perfect, to perfection, right? He tells us, it's very simple. Jesus' commandments are the roadmap. Jesus actually gives us a commandment about perfection. Jesus tells us, therefore, you shall be perfect. Oh, gee, Jesus, thanks. That was easy, right? All I got to do is just go out there and be perfect, right? Right? And, and, and it's, it's stuff like this that makes me feel, Jesus, that it's just too far out of reach. How can, I, how can I be perfect? And then to make it better, like how perfect is perfect? He wants to give us a standard to measure up our perfect. Like maybe my perfect is not as perfect as your perfect. So how perfect is perfect? I mean, for perfect to be perfect, perfect enough, right? He says, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Oh my goodness. So I'm supposed to be as perfect as the mastermind of the creator the, of the universe, as God himself. How, how does that happen? If we go and we look at the word perfect that's used here, the word that's used here, forget about the Greek, it's teleos, but that doesn't matter. Like, what it means is the natural end of something. What it me means is mature. What it means is something which is fully grown to its fullest stature. The word teleos is like, we use it like, uh, there's a lot of Greek in, 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 in science, right? So, you know, for, for the scientists in the room, you know, you've got chromosomes, your genetic code and such, and at the end of your chromosomes, you've got these things called telomeres, right? And, and as you go through life, your telomeres shorten. So there's this there, there's this thing out there, you know, like, can we actually, uh, you know, live forever if we could manage to, to keep our, to keep our telomeres from shrinking? You know what I mean? And all, they're like, there's all kinds of 
you know, people working on the things that chop up tel telomeres are called telomerases, you know, enzymes that cut telomeres or telomeres or whatever. I don't know, it's been a long time since I've done this. I don't know how to pronounce it anymore, but right? But the point is, is that they're the thing at the end. The word telo or teleos is the thing at the end, the thing at its natural end, at its natural progression. When you see, you know, when you see, uh, you know, a plant grow from a, from a seedling to a shrub to this to that, and it, it's, it's achieved its, its, its fullest growth, when you see a child grow, when you, when you grow in your career, when anything, whatever it is that's growing, and it's, what is the expected end point? Jesus is telling us that the expected end point is to be just as your Father in heaven. That's what this word perfect that he uses twice here, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be mature, whole, complete, achieve the fullness of maturity, which is what we've been talking about, how to, how to grow from, from this to that, right? And so St. Anthony tells us, he tells us that perfection in spiritual life is achieved through diligence. It's through putting one foot in front of the next. It's through not giving up. It's through committing to work hard at something and continuing to work hard at it. You know, nobody's surprised in the room. Why? Well, because the natural progression of your career to get to, to get to the expected end point of your career, you're going to have to do the same thing. And to get to the natural end point of raising your children, you're going to have to do the same thing. You can't, you, your children can't start shouting and screaming one day and you just throw up your arms and say, that's it. I give up. And you just walk out of the house and never come back. That you will never, you, you will never bring those children to the fullness of their maturity. You'll never bring your career to the fullness of it. I know lots of parents look at me and they're saying, don't tempt me, Father John. Don't tempt me. Right? But it's, it's what St. Anthony's been telling us all along. Just put one foot in front of the other. Diligence. Diligence. The, the ability to to work at something with persistence, regardless of whatever obstacles come in our way. St. Anthony tells us that a part of this diligence is to not allow ourselves to be brought into slavery by any desire or anything in our lives. Right? Because the moment that the moment that I have an addiction to food, I have an addiction to drugs, I have an addiction to alcohol, I have an addiction to whatever it may be, to relationships. You know, there's people who are in serial relationships. You know, they can't be more than two days out of a breakup. They gotta be with somebody else, right? There's whatever it may be, right? I'm not, I, you know, I have my own addictions and you have yours. Not, I'm not judging nobody, right? But as long as, as long as there's something that would, that can successfully hold me back from putting one foot in front of another, Saint Anthony is telling us that puts you at risk. Diligence in what, St. Anthony? He always comes back to the same stuff, man. Just keep Jesus' commandments. St. Anthony was, uh, you know, some people complexify things and some people make them simple. St. Anthony keeps it simple. You know, the kiss principle. Keep it simple. It's stupid. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Just keep it, keep it simple. Right? Just follow. Do you see what Jesus says? And ask him, how do I do this in my day, in my day today? He says something, and he's writing a letter to his to his some of his children. He says, the son speaking about Christ, my children does not reveal his heavenly Father to those who dwell in darkness, but to those who abide in light, those who are children of light. How do I become this child of light, Saint Anthony, whose hearts have been illuminated by the knowledge of the divine commandments? What he's saying is this: is that you know. You know, I don't know this Holy Spirit stuff you're talking about, Father John. I don't know this stuff. Open up anywhere in the Sermon on the Mount. Open up what Jesus has to say. Find a commandment and do it. And that's where you go from being book smart to street smart. That's where you're going from having head knowledge to having heart knowledge. That's where you go from having, from having paper cuts on your fingers to muscles from working hard, right? The point that St. Anthony is saying is that 
Jesus' commandments, the gospel, scripture wasn't written so people could do PhDs about it. Like, I'm happy we're right next to the university that people do PhDs in theology. That's great. Good for them. But for you and me, it was written so that we could do it, right? And it's in doing it that you acquire all of this experience and you have like this, this experience of doing it. When he says, lend and expect nothing in return, and you do that, you know, and then you have an experience through that. When somebody is, you know, you know, cruel to you and you choose to be kind back to them, that's an experience. And as you go through that experience, and as your mind and my mind is illuminated to the knowledge of the divine commandments, what he's telling us is that what's written is the tip of the iceberg. So you're just, you know, if you're if you if you read only and you don't do, what you're doing is like you're 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 on an Alaskan cruise and you're just looking at all the tips of the icebergs. And you're saying, I know how big those icebergs are. But you don't. Well, but I've been on this cruise for three days, and I've been looking at them all, and I've been counting them, and I've been, you know, drawing them, and well, and I've been translating them to Greek and back into English, and, you know, no, just do it. Just do it, you know? Just go swimming with the iceberg. You'll know how cold that iceberg really is, right? And that's what St. Anthony is telling us, that our mind is illuminated by us doing the commandments, something magical happens where we see what's written come to life and it becomes, it's no longer ink on paper, it becomes experience, it becomes part of our life. Jesus says about his own teachings, he says, my words are spirit and they are life and that's what they ought to be for you and me. St. Anthony is talking about St. Paul, he loved St. Paul very much and he says, our teacher St. Paul indicates that we ought to sprint towards perfection. The ultimate goal. It says, I discipline my body and bring it into submission. St. Paul is saying that. So St. Anthony is saying, if St. Paul says that, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, how much more should I be saying that St. Anthony is saying? If St. Anthony is saying about that about St. Paul, how much more should I be, you know what I mean? Should I, should I be doing that? Our previous patriarch, Pope Shenouda, quoting St. Isaac the Syrian, says something really beautiful. He says, once... Once you see the lighthouse of faith, once, once you can see what direction to walk in, don't walk, run, sprint, he says, similar to what St. Anthony is saying. And St. Isaac the, Se the Syrian said it before him, right? Sprint, run with all your might. And if you get tired from sprinting, run. And if you get tired from running, walk. And if you get tired from walking, I don't know, trudge along. And if you get tired from trudging along, crawl. And if you get tired from crawling, slither on your stomach. But one thing don't do, don't stop. Because you think you're running on flat ground, but you're not, right? And the moment you stop, you start sliding backwards, right? So don't allow anything to pull you backwards. Diligence and this desire to sprint Forwards, one foot after another. Now, St. Anthony mentioned a different kind of perfection to us. He mentioned to us a perfection through grace. This is completely different. The first one was perfection of spiritual life. The first one was, you know, praying regularly, <coughs> fasting and reading the Bible and, and participating in all of the life of the church and being at church early and and doing charitable works and loving every homeless person in Toronto. And, and, you know, that was the first one. This is completely different. This, and they're, they're related and they're both necessary. This is completely different. This is through grace. The word grace is, is a very simple word, which means an undeserved gift. St. Anthony acknowledges and encourages us that our Christian perfection, being perfect as Jesus is perfect, is by us being welcomed into Christ. It's not something you do, it's someone who you are. Once you become family, once you become family of Jesus, you're family with him. 
Whatever belongs to him belongs to you. All the perfection that ought to be his becomes yours. In the Psalms, King David says, perfect that which concerns me, Psalm 138, verse 8, or, or complete that which, which um, concerns me. It's almost like I filled my cup as much as I can, but it's only half full. And then I put it under, under the tap, and it fills to overflowing. How full is the cup? 100% full. And more, it's full to overflowing. St. James, talking about the same thing, tells us, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This relationship between perfection and completeness. St. Anthony is telling you and he's telling me that once you put your hand in hand with Christ, it's his job to bring you to the fullness of your Christian perfection. The perf your perfection in spiritual life is your opportunity, your and my opportunity to, to give an offering of thanks. And that's why we oftentimes refer to all the stuff we do in church as a sacrifice of praise. Yes, we're, we're sacrificing, you know, but the sacrifice we're doing is is thanksgiving, is praise. It's, it's a response to all of, all of the goodness that God has done. And what God is telling you and he's telling me is that you don't need to do anything special to go from being a baby to a little girl to a school girl to, you know, to be older and so on. The, this is a natural progression of growth. You know, you don't need to pass exams. You don't need to... Right? This is going to happen. It's going to happen on its own. So long as you keep, you walk hand in hand with Christ. His grace is enough to cover us. Right? And to cover us to what point? To cover us, he says, until we reach the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. How full is Christ? That's how full He's planning to fill you up and to fill me up. And when the Father looks down, He sees you as already full. He sees you as already perfect. He sees you as already complete. He sees you as already as full as Jesus. That's what Christian perfection is. It's what you receive as a free undeserved gift. Nothing you can do can earn it. Trying to earn grace is like trying to plan your own surprise birthday party. Just doesn't work like that. It's something that you get. It's an undeserved gift, so you can't do anything to deserve it, right? Now, what we do is on the other side of the coin is our spirit, our perfection in spiritual life is what we work towards, and that's an offering of thanksgiving and an offering of praise. Let's stand now as we get ourselves ready to sing one last song and to thank God. All glory be to you, O Lord. All glory be to you for how gracious you are. Who else in the universe takes the poorest of the poor and makes them as rich as the King of Heaven? Who else in the universe, O Lord, takes all of humanity in his embrace. Give us, Lord, to have full confidence in your grace, to see ourselves in the perfection of Jesus, that, that the perfection of Jesus is added unto us. You know, we respond, we do our best, we, we put our two cents in, we, 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 we bring our five loaves and two fish, you know, but Lord, you take all that we have and you make it perfect. All glory and honor and might be to you in your church forever and ever.